I welcome you all to the first technical session of this International Women's Conference on uh, Women's Literature. So I would at the outset like to thank the organizers for having me here for this uh, um, technical session and giving me the opportunity to chair it as well. Um, so uh, we have, uh, I think, five uh, presenters who are going to present their papers in this technical session in the order. Uh, the first one, as uh, the organizer just mentioned, Dr. Ekta Chahal. Uh, and second is uh, Ankita Huku. I think she's also present here. We have Aishwarya Krishna. Uh, I guess she would be joining. And um, um, on the fourth number is uh, Anup Kumar Das. And the fifth presenter would be Deepti Makwan. So this is the order in which uh, you are going to present. Uh, time allocated to each presenter would be 10 minutes or maybe less because we have five presenters and we have one hour to wind up the session. And I would request everybody to mute their um, mics so that uh, there is no disturbance. And um, the questions and observations uh, will be taken up after the presentations. So I request all of you to adhere to the time limit and do not try to encroach on each other's time slot, which is allocated. So I, um, without much ado, I invite the first speaker, Dr. Um, Ekta Chahal. She's the assistant professor, Department of English at Nilm University, Kethal, Haryana. The title of her presentation is Acquainting a New Woman in Nantara Segal's The Day in Shadow. So over to you, Ekta, for your presentation. Before to start, I would like to welcome everyone, a very warm welcome, all the research scholars and Sangeeta ma'am and other dignitaries present over here. Uh, today, my title for this presentation is Acquainting a New Women in Nantara Segal's The Day in Shadow. The Day in Shadow, which was written in 1971, by Nantara Segal, who was the third, who was the niece of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, accentuates the need to readdress and refresh the Indian social, ethical, and religious conventions and attitudes towards marriage. The conservative approach, which depends, which demands submission of the wife to the unquestionable authority of her husband, often causes much misery and victimization. And this present paper explores that women who belongs to the sphere of intense, sharpened sensibility can no longer accept the victimization and the suppression completely as her destiny. Refusing inequality and male chauvinism, she demands a humane and compassionate approach to marriage based on love, care, involvement, honesty, equality, and free communication, especially. So, the Dame Shadow is the story of a woman's attempt to establish her personal identity. Simri, a protagonist, is an educated woman, a professional writer, and yet she allows her self-image to be neglected by Song, her husband, patriarchal domination. She gathers up the courage to leave him only when he himself refuses to continue with an unsuccessful marriage. The divorce has actually taken place as the novel begins and with divorce comes the actual realization of the misery, the realization of the misery, the economic hardships, the feeling of loneliness and a score of other existential problems. Because she signs the consent terms of her divorce settlement without understanding their implications. Having been divorced, she turns to Raj not to her own inner resources to achieve selfhood. Ironically, the person upon whom she depends for mental and emotional subsistence displays, in spite of his combative feminist sentiments, the same male lordliness and the same patriarchal thoughts that had sharpened Song's behavior towards That same after getting the divorce, even she never turned to herself she turned to another man uh, in order to attain that uh, support, in order to attain that emotional uh, 
emotional love care this was her biggest mistake the novel interrogates and stresses the urban wealthy class in milieu in a metropolitan situation only to bring home an equally miserable reality of indian women's plight simrit had herself been sown named charmed by his flash contrasting so vividly with her solitary book loving child she had felt that song has color and life and action but the glimmer of song's personality had misguided sirit as she later realizes that tragic mistake she got attracted towards song only by his physical appearance and later on when they got tied in a marital knot uh, she realizes her mistake that uh, he is not the right person for her Simit is a sensitive and tender-hearted woman who expects Song to foster an inseparable relationship based on love, involvement, care, equality, honesty, understanding, and free communication. But for Song, Simit is only a valuable possession, and he expects her to attain to his ideal of strained womanhood. Song dominates Simit completely, so much so that she has no say in the ordinary decisions of the household. Song's world of commerce, ambition, and power has no room for softer moral norms, values, and friendships. Sinrit, on the other hand, is a scholarly woman who values scholarship, ethical integrity, and most significantly, decent human relationships. Sinrit was only demanding a decent human relationship where she can uh, find uh, love, care, tenderness in that particular relationship with Song. All Song's relationships are governed by material considerations, motivated by a sense of ruthless ambition, which provokes no obstructions. Song's growing obsession with power and possession disgusts Sindrith, and one day she decided to take a decision. After when Song invited her for a divorce, only only then. she stood by herself only then she got the courage to take a decision that she is willing to take a divorce with song even with bridge son of simrit and song song substitutes money for affection care and interest song is already attuned to the palliatives of the money world and has only these to offer For his own point of view, Som finds himself a good husband as he has earned so much money. Simrit wants to get a warm, cold atmosphere where there is some goal beyond self-advancement. Som, however, fails even to understand Simrit's grief and expectation. He feels his duty to his wife is over just by providing a wonderful life of affluence and luxury. Uh, even Som believes that that he is capable of uh, providing enough resources and uh, luxurious things in his house, and that is enough for Sindrit to live a good life with him. And this is the only base for their good relationship. Even the dissonance in their relationship. cast its shadow on their sexual relationship even simrit wants the physical act to be infused with the emotional involvement whereas for song it is merely a physical act simrit therefore feels approached and abandoned in a husband centered world the divorce settlement continues to weigh heavily on her not only in social economic but in psychological terms too the issue of marriage could be dissolved by human expertise anatomy went on and on and skeleton could endure for a million years because we cannot even uh, understand that the wound of a divorced woman that how she is uh, how she is confronting the situation in this patriarchal or male dominant society So manages to pin down Simrit in the role of a victim by way of divorce settlement called consent. The higher tax payments are an attempt to enslave her in every way, and divorce, instead of ushering in a new beginning, confirms a confrontation with the age-old orthodox views regarding the status of women. Simrit realizes that the higher tax payments are not a mistake or an oversight, but Song's way of punishing her. 
events by showing uh, the heavy money or paying uh, debt or paying taxes on time or uh, giving him alimony on time he was even uh, very much confident that he is uh, uh, completing his duty duty and responsibilities very well recovering from bewilderment and emotional trauma of divorce in his struggle to build a new life for herself and her children she meant she needs raj a sincere and nice bachelor and member of parliament the broad sympathies and humane attitude of raj attract her steadily he helps smooth regain her equilibrium both emotional and intellectual unlike some and like simrit raj values tremendously the human values and human response to life she thinks that raj is the only stable element in the emotional diverse of her new world the relationship which begins as a friendly companionship soon grows into a strong relationship involving both of them deeply significantly raj values simrit as an individual not as a possession raj encourages simrit to start living with a new zest mentor sagar here portrays the physical love of simrit and raj frankly and freely when both raj and simrit are sure of the deep bond of intimacy and love their relationship is consummated to them physical love comes naturally and spontaneously with the reassurance that the bond between them was reliable raj proposes marriage to simrit knowing too well that she has hordes of children and a monstrous tax problem to him simrit an uprooted mother of several children is essential a woman of culture what comes Second most is the need for a mature approach to marriage, the need to nurture it with love, care, and candor. The relationship of Raj and Sundar is grounded in sympathy and understanding, human communication and friendship, rather than bestial sensuality and cruel insensitivity. Clearly, the exploitation she talks of is not an obvious, recognizable form of physical exploitation. against which most people will naturally raise a cry but a subtle human form of exploitation a sort of breathing wear that and bruises don't show the indignation of the author at simit's helplessness and the appalling situation is clear in when she says that divorce for women nature is like a sin simit herself is able to transcend the middle class sensibility of indian women in grain over time with great difficulty and introspection now i'm here concluding my part nenitara sagal strongly delineates in her novel the dilemma of a modern woman the protagonist of the novel rejects the existing traditions and social construct she becomes more confident of her emotional needs and aims for self fulfillment she pursues to live a more liberal and individualistic way of life however she is ambushed and enslaved because of her dependence on her husband sagal has truly shown the hardships and sufferings involved in fighting against an established order she tries to attain her individuality within within the framework of society Sagal believes that women should try to understand and realize herself as a human being, and not just as an appendage to some male life. Similarly, in the day in shadow in this present novel, really emerges as a new woman who does not want to compromise with her uniqueness and identity. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to me very patiently. Uh, now, everyone is welcome for asking questions. uh thank you dr ekta chahal for your presentation um you talked about uh divorce and the implications of divorce in the indian society is the reference to nantara sagal's um novel a new uh, the, the day in shadow yeah the day in shadow and you talked about the woman's burden who's trapped in a you know and an uncomfortable marriage and then the burden of divorce and the divorce settlement um, and the economic problems thereof and the problems that she has to face as a woman in uh, 
in an Indian um, setup. And as you said, this novel was published in 1970s or so, post-independence era. Um, I think uh, now some somewhat the situation is not very different, but there, there are subtle changes that are coming in our society regarding the acceptance of uh, divorced women. But still, it is treated as a stigma in our society. And um, um, uh, you talked about uh, Simrit, uh, the protagonist, I believe, uh, what I gather from your paper. Um, she uh, deals with the stigma of divorce and the women's demand for equality and freedom through and, um, the author who becomes a spokesperson for Simrit. And um, um, her, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what bothers me, uh, you also talked about this, what bothers me that she again goes for, uh, uh, you know, another uh, man and her uh, dependence uh, for sustenance, um, you know, she again goes towards another man for sustenance. And this theme, you just, uh, you know, just touched upon it. I, I wish you could have um, dwelt a little more on that and uh, why she had to, you know, again look for another man for sustenance and uh, i have a little um, question for you uh, do you think if uh, she was economically independent uh, her situation post divorce would have been uh, different from what uh, she is now in the novel i mean had she absolutely, been absolutely, absolutely ma'am because in present scenario the first thing that our mother or our parents now teaching uh, uh, us that uh, firstly you should be financially independent so that you cannot be dependent on your husband on your father on your brother see life is a roller coaster and uh, situations will uh, will definitely change in a moment like this so it is not uh, a center it is not uh, you know very it is not uh, sure that uh, we always uh, lives uh, live, live a life smoothly even after marriage so it is really important for each and every woman to be uh, self-dependent and in the case of Simrit, if she was financially independent then i think the story will be changed that she will be she will try to become a strong independent personality of the society rather than uh, rather than to go in the search of her emotional support that what i do, what i gather from your presentation is that she was educated i mean it's some kind yes, of an autobiography yes, yes, yes. Novel, but yet still she does not pursue any um you know profession or um, means of livelihood uh, absolutely because she she she, she didn't find she she doesn't find the uh, support to uh, to go in that particular direction because she was not uh, you know uh, that much encouraged to uh, take step forward for herself so, so that, she, uh, that that means i mean uh, i mean even if education is not the criteria for economic independence i mean you have I mean, to uh, personally i didn't because uh, because many uh, many uh, less educated women are doing really well as an uh, entrepreneur or uh, uh, doing a, a good business uh, by making by using their talent uh, while they are doing stitching knitting or anything yes. like this okay thank you ekta chahal and another thing uh, i think a divorced woman becomes a threat to the society because of her uh, you know being dependent on others so the only way the um, women can, uh, you know, shirk off this stigma is by becoming economically independent, no matter what, educated or whatever. But you have to take finances in your hands and you have to earn for yourself. So it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you for your lovely presentation, Ekta. It was good to hear you. So uh, thank you. Um, any other question from the participants here would like to ask Ekta? I guess there's nobody who is volunteering. So I move on to the next presenter. Um, I cannot see her. Ankita Huku. Is she here? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, ma Ankita Huku. Okay. Uh, yes, I can see you. Oh, you can turn off your uh, video if, you, if you're having a no, video. No, no, no. It's, it's comfortable for me. 
Okay, so let me just briefly introduce you. Uh, we have the next paper presenter, Ankita Huku. She's a research scholar from Jainaran Vyas University, Jodhpur, Rajasthan. And um, uh, she is, her paper is titled Unraveling the Post Feminist Perspective of Sita and Draupadi. Am I right? And yes, ma'am. Yeah. Over to you, Ankita. You have precisely 10 minutes. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. A very good morning to all of presenters, scholars, and academians. My today's topic of webinar is unraveling the post-feminist perspective of Sita and Robbie and approach. To begin with the post-feminism, first I will deal with the feminist ideology. A journey, a strong woman, I begin with a quote, a strong woman who knows that she has strength enough for the journey, but a woman of strength know it is in the journey where she will become strong. In the light of the thoughtful learning of the feminist perspective, the present study seek to envision and comprehend the feminist ideology with a substantial study of mythological heroines, Sita and Draupadi, which are often worshipped as epitome of post-feminist. Further pertaining to the idea of ongoing thought process, the present approach endeavors to encapsulate the historical reference to the ideology in order to have a better understanding of the genre and to furnish it in the cascade of the academic literature. Initially, talking about the feminism, it was a moment to get an equal treatment with regard to men. For accomplishing this objective, they have fought a long battle with men. And their main concern was to get equality in the varied aspect of life. As I have shortly described the feminism, I turned to the feminist ideology. It was considered as an undertaking to oppose the hindrance, which came under the path of equality for women. By summing up the idea of feminist ideology, with a special reference from the Indian mythological character Sita and Draupadi, these women had many similarities in them and had fought her lifelong battle from society to create their own independent identity in the world of epic literature from the role model for younger generation. I, spoke, I shift my perspective from feminism to post-feminism perspective of Sita and Draupadi in a very general sense. Post-feminism was a movement against the third and the second wave of feminism. The issue which remained incomplete in the second wave and third wave was complete through the emergence of the post-feminism. The post-feminism had somewhat started during the second half of the 20th century, but the term was familiarized in 1999-1919 in the journal Female Literary Radicals, in which revolutionists stated that we are interested in people now, not in men and women, that moral, social, economic, and political standards should not have anything to do with sex. That it would be pro woman without being anti sans is called post feminist. So, the post feminist had given the image of a new womanhood, the woman who, have, who seems to be independent, have their own choice, and most importantly, they have formed their own identity in the society. This evolution of new women was totally different from the image of women who have suffered throughout their life, was considered, was always cons considered inferior to the men in the society. Thus, post-feminism has given such an image of a new woman to the society. I further enhanced my thought process. The study takes back to the past decades of Indian mythology, where there was the emergence of the two strong women character who had fought for their own identity under the rule of the patriarchal system. Sita, wife of Rama, had questioned the societal on proving about the woman's chastity. Although she had gone through Agni Pariksha, the criteria set by the society, to proving woman purity, but afterwards going through this Agni Pariksha, Sita never returned to Ram, because, but rather returned to Jan Bhumi, where she had originated because she can't face the humiliation and agony from the society. Sita's strength can be foreshadowed in every episode of the ep epic from beginning till the end of the epic. As early stage, we have seen that she, Sita has played with the Shiva's bows, which seems to have enormous strength in her. At this point of time, Janak, Janak seems to be astonished by her strength and further decides whosoever wants to marry his daughter should also able to uplift the bow so that there seems to be an equal match between both of them. Her strength can envision in the Lankan episode 
where Ravana, the king of Lanka, had enslaved Sita, but she had never surrendered against his will. And Stan has a strong woman hoping that King Rama would set her free. Sita had not only strong will, strength, but also the independence of the choice that she had made, which can be seen further, the choice she made to leave the luxurious lifestyle and go away with King Rama to exile in the forest. Secondly, she made her choice of being single mother and independently done the nourishment of her children, love and Kush. And thirdly, in the final scene, when she had gone, when she had done her duty of reunion of her sons to their father, her goal was accomplished and she had asked her motherland to observe her as she was not able to face the humiliation again by knowing with her husband. Her remindful words are, if I am truthful and pure, please observe me, Mahadev. By ending the character of Sita, I further approach to the character of Draupadi as she was often considered an extraordinary character from the epic Mahabharata. Her origin from the sacrificial fire called Yajna clearly indicates about the ferocious attitude towards Pandavas and Kauravas. Her strong willpower can be envisaged in the act of Polyndrous marriage, despite of the fact that she had fallen for Arjuna, but due to the societal norms, she got married to all five brothers. Despite of everything, Draupadi seems to be dauntless and virtuous woman who agrees to the polygamy marriage and created a stability between five husbands. Even her strength can be anticipated in the period of exile where she tried to strengthen her husbands to behave like soldiers and to get revenge from the Kauravs. As Draupadi had never forgotten the humiliation done to her and she was eagerly waiting for an opportunity to punish them. Even though her independence choice can be seen during the period of exile where she had accompanied her husband. Further pertaining to the idea of injustice, Draupadi had managed to fight with the injustice happened to her. She staunchly opposes the injustice, whether it was a Chiraharan episode or the period of exile. As she always speaks her mind rather than soaring on her destiny path. In Shilharan episode, Draupadi had devoted herself to Krishna to help her out. And at that heat of moment, Draupadi had taken an oath in which clearly declared the war with Kauravs, where she angrily responds she would, she would not wash her hair until she first washes them with the blood of Dushasana and Duryodhan. This bold and fearless nature of Draupadi had actually made her warn in this episode, whereas Kauravs were defeated through their own plan. As I'm concluding my topic, sum up, summing up the whole thought process of Sita and Draupadi as an epitome of a post-feminist, that these women had fought for an injustice happened to them in the every strand of their life. And despite of everything, they emerged as a strong and independent woman. They have followed the societal norms, but had never compromised in hiding their real identity. Thus, Sita and Draupadi had chosen as a post-feminist icon in the world of epic literature. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita, for your presentation. Uh, your paper talked about post-feminism with reference to women from the ep two epics, Mahabharata and the Ramayana. You talked mm -hmm. about the evolution of new women in uh, in the society um and also um i i, I would like to make an observation uh, that uh, you know feminism it emerged in the west as yes, a theory, it emerged in the west and uh, but we uh, in in our epics we can show a way forward to the fem western feminism that in our ancient times we had women like Sita and Draupadi and other many other women from the ancient Indian uh, times who were truly empowered, and um, you know uh, they they have truly proved to be empowered, and we can uh, actually quote from the these epics. Um, there is there there are a few you know critics and writers and um, researchers who uh, who try to bring down these women um, as, as sufferers, as, uh, you know, shadows of their uh, 
husbands. But um, uh, of late, a lot of research is being done in order to show the, um, you know, the empowerment of these uh, women from the ancient epics. And uh, um, uh, this was one observation. You could have also, uh, Ankita, I think you can bring in that um, concept of swayamvar in your uh, paper. That swayamvar is also a, 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 a very uh, powerful agency which is given in the hands of women during the ancient time when they got the opportunity of choosing their spouses. You, you did mention about Shiva's ball, but you could, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, talk about Swayamvar as an agency which wields a lot of power, um, which gives a lot of power to these women in the ancient times. And um, it's, it's, it was a wonderful uh, way of giving women power to choose rather than men choosing. Um, so this is just a obs an observation and a suggestion which you can include in your paper if you would like to. So uh, thank you so much, Ankita. Uh, it was a good presentation. Thank you. Um, now we have our next presenter. I can see uh, she's joined. She is Aishwarya Krishna. Um, Aishwarya is Krishna. Yeah. Hello. Uh, let, me just, let me just briefly introduce you to others. Uh, Aishwarya Krishna is a second year MA English student from BCM College, Kotayam. The title of her presentation is Realizing the Darkness of the Slave Woman in uh, Marlon James, the Book of Night Woman. So over to you, Aishwarya, for your presentation. Yeah. Good morning, ma'am, and other all passengers to join in this conference. Uh, ma'am already introduced me that myself, Aishwarya, and PG student. So in this international conference on women in literature, I'm presenting here on the topic about realizing the darkness of the slave woman uh, in Marlon James, the book of Night Woman. About the author, Ma Marlon James is a Jamaican author. Uh, his notable works were um, uh, the book of Night Woman and the brief history of seven killings and uh, uh, Black Leopard, uh, Red Wolf, and many others too. So here we're gonna look out the novel, the book of Night Woman, is written in 2009 novel and based on the genre of historical fiction and um, 18th century slaveries, etc. So, ma'am, can I press in PPT here? Yes, sure. You can do that. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Aishwarya, we're not able to see your presentation. Oh, uh, not see it? No. Oh, wait, ma'am, wait, ma'am, one, one minute. Yes, now your presentation is visible. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, I'm just frustrated. About... Okay. Stay cool, it's visible. Okay, man. So, about the, uh, we already said that about the author and about the no novel. So, Marlon James, The Book of Night Woman, is both beautifully written and devastating. So, James' narrative related in the hard edge but written dialects takes us back to the cruel world of Jamaican sugar plantation at the turn of 19th century. So, as we all know, uh, know that the one reason about the woman's case, even at the 18th century or 19th century or later centuries, right, the women have no potential right to show their kind of freedom, right? So, they are struggling through the different stages of darkness, violence, and uh, other slaveries, etc. So the problem of violence against women manifests itself as a terrifying area from the throughout the world. So the call uh, of this paper is where attention to the, the problems of uh, violence or the darkness, uh, slavery has become the part of the woman in the, through the novels and how the uh, shades of true darkness and true womanness uh, as were portrayed in the 
normal. So the object speaks that uh first i'm introducing the main protagonist of the novel uh that is the female slave born on the plantation named lilith so even at the young age the older woman on the plantation sense is very dark power around her lilith is brought lilith is a main character is brought up by the another slave on the plantations so she is sent to live and working plantation owner's house from there lilith develops into a very powerful young owner uh she is eventually invited by the group of female slaves in the plantations who meet under the cover of darkness to join them in one of their secret meetings so these are the night women we're introducing here and from these the secret women's lilith learns that the woman are planning with the slave revolt so basically uh here we're introducing the woman's struggle darkness in the novel the first of all is saying about violence that is the violence in the black the book of night woman is not limited to lily but it pervades the entire fabric of the narratives so uh, we know that the violence were of course into different ways the instrumental violence and the affective violence in the novel so uh, the instrumental violence is refers as the means to an end and the affective violence is end in itself driven by the emotion So the book of Night Woman encompasses both. So it is all pervasive. The whites, the blacks, masters, servants, men, and women contributed to and affected by the web of white. So that is the body, the representing in the seat of a punishment for the woman who indulges in violence and photos for violence people. So that the basically the female characters having to adopt the punish could not make a public spectacle for the violence. Uh, nonetheless, their uh, brutalities were not less spectacular here. And uh, the novel, the book of Night Woman, the uh, the Lilith is represented as a black woman, right? So the black woman, like Lilith, are subjected to the forms of exploitations, oppressions, and violence as male slaves. in addition they become the victims of sexual abuse and harassment by both white and black men it's exploring the indirect themes of indirect black violence so james participated in a powerful intertextual dialogues with slave narrators that is in the end uh, that the fight for the end of the slavery and racial oppressions when they come at objects was to stress the slaves moral incorruptibility integrity and superiority over their white oppressors and therefore the most antebellum slave narratives authors prioritize black sort of unity and loyalty rather than into black violence and black disorder and next week uh, james uh, here represent the powerful uh, course that be constructed with the historian jeff forrest that despite that overtly romantic interpretations of the harmonious and idyllic slaves communities are virtually devoid to conflict in other word in the novel james um, portrayed that demonstrate that how the slaves on multiple escape from the bonds of friendships and love had the comfort in the struggle against their white oppressors and support each other in the moments of danger and desperation this is particular it explore the complex power relationship between the black and slave women and men so the book of night women's however james refuses to represent his female characters as passive and submissive that is he highlighted mainly through the slave women's strong inner determinations to offer violent resistance in an act of self defense lilith seriously injures that other uh, the courts they are mentioned here she grabbed the pot of serosity and don't care that it burn in her figure what a man says but before him could even Ma'am, is audible? Yes, I think you got a call coming, so we got disconnected for a while. Oh, Continue. Oh, okay. So they don't care even shave the shitan over the pot of tea on his face. So in this phase of novel, at least for a short moment, James and Rolaisus encounter violence and the liberating effect it does in Lilith. 
So there is a card mentioning here, here that that was the first time she feel the darkness, the true darkness and true womanness that make man scream. That empowered by her new sense of self, Lilith has the strength to fight against her attacker. So in these chapters, we can see that she manages to escape the sexual abuse by killing the would be the rapist as with the witness. So this scenes place that it foreshadows the night woman and the Lilith acts of violence against the white masters and fellow slaves in the course of narratives. So then describing the night woman here. The night woman in James' novels have no difference. That is, uh, as far as the black women is uh, concerned, the hierarchical and then based on the kind of work they did seem not existing when they become the subject of violence, right? So the uh, the novel, uh, the white peoples were oppressed and uh, these black peoples, and the white man enjoyed unreal power on the estate and he uses this power to get sexual gratifications more than anything else. So this coming to the land where a man can seduce, rape, or sodomize any nigger woman or boy or girl, he wish uh, there was nothing that nobody coined before a white man being to the scene. So that is the you're mentioning that the violence that is inherent in the sexual act of intercourse is taken to brutal extremities in the book of Nightmare. So not only the woman and her consent on the act treated as in Consequential, but she is also expected to come from all the sexual actors with the new submissions. And the no in the novels, uh, the main character Lilith that recognizes that what Marlon James claims as the true darkness and the uh, true womanness. So, however, the Lilith's true darkness does not make her immune to violence. That is, she chances to sexually abusing such a slave woman. Who face was well and cut off and washed with so much blood that she dripped red. So Lilith wonders at how a white man can drink or carry on as he pleased. So Lilith looks at the slave woman's uh, dead body and shudders. The rebels and Lilith does not allow her to mute spectators to violence for long. So the woman uh, may not always be the cause of violence, but that does not mean that. Uh, their lives remain unjust by it. Uh, they are often spectators to men that man creates. So James hereby knows, however, the woman cannot claim immunity from the uh, men around them. So they are the cause, secondhand perpetrators or next possible victims of violence that they witness around them. Next, he mentioned about the slavery. That the slavery of the Book of Night Woman incest creates abominable conditions of the anti blackness that can lead to morally unacceptable actions on the part of this obsessed and exploited, blurring, at least on the surface, the allegory clearly cut distinctions between black victims and white victims. That is, James will portray that. The James traces his uh, protagonist development in the martyrs and seeking in the foregrounds the centrality of violence to black life. And it explores the reasons for the violence, um, tensions, and the conflicts within the black community. So, hereby, James uh, novel stresses that many slaves that adapt to the overwhelming reality and the humiliations for their circumstances in order to survive. So, uh, the Lilith uh, the criticizes that the night woman's plans to start a slave rebellion after these torment moments, the torment conditions to her lives. Uh, she uh, quoted that, me get my blood and see me here. Lilith says that nothing different or nothing better. Revenge don't leave me nothing but. Then burning skin smell that cannot blow off me nose for washing up. So in this phase of the novel, the Lilith, Lilith is depicted as a complex and self-critical, but also self-confidence. A uh, heroine refusing to fulfill the night woman's expectations of the uncosting the black female corporations. So, in the uh, novel, The Book of Night Women, James to employs that to chop off this statistics and a brutal female mistress uh, and to shed light of the dangerous effects of the slavery on black uh, and white societies. Moreover, uh, that he explored the meaning of slavery as thingifications. Uh, by explicitly describing the atrocious acts of the violence against the black human flesh. So,
so the novel defies the hegemonic uh, and the notions of ember by pointing out the explosives and the antagonist relationship between the colonizers and colonized that is the antagonizing women in the novels are also complex right that is um, so the uh, uh, saying the example that is about that the characters is master like love interest and expert of future wives to challenge the traditional european race of womanhood so therefore the novel shows how at the times the hypersexual uh, synonymous with being uh, caribbeans and indus textiles related to being Africans. so marlon seems here by explore how enslaved women and caribbean women deal with the con constraints sexualities and sexualizations of their bodies and how they use their sexuality as a means of escapism so the basically the novel not only explore the colonizer colonizer slavery relationships etc but also the power struggles involved in the marginalized populations so uh, the following acts of violence and carried out by the lilith could be interpreted as a form of um, uh, the self liberations and attempt to explore, express their freedom as a human being so uh and in fact after killing her masters the novel protagonist the re-experience the sense of empowerment so lilith hereby feel a new thing under skin that something that jingle as her heart jump up and down it never be so false in her love so thus the true darkness and true womanness that makes men screams and as in the sense of um uh, first mentioning the paris killing at the novel's beginning right so, so lily at the time the lily articulates her willingness to fight against the white patriarchal systems for lit the notions of true womanhood is not all linked with the submissives and passivity but with the resistance and disappointment so coming to the conclusion part uh in the book of the james offers that unsparing account of the slaves experience of being trapped in the vicious circle of violence and highlighting the utterly destructive nature of slavery significations as well as the institution lasting impact of the further black generation and james attempts to narrate from those perspectives and the uh, women in general uh, women's in generals and slave women in particular so that is you know, we can see that um that problem of violence against women that uh manifest it's at the terrifying part of the experience of the violence uh, throughout the world so the experience of uh violence in revisions is a common thread uh it's a fabric of women's everyday lives in societies that around the world so violence against the woman is a social construction based on the uh, societal concepts about the rules and right of men and women so i hope all will understand about my topic thank you Uh, thank you, Aishwarya S. Krishna, for your presentation. Uh, Aishwarya's paper was based on Marlon James' The Book of Night Woman. Um, and uh, her paper talked about power dynamics, complicated power dynamics, I would say. Power struggles involving marginalized uh, populations or at a sugar plantation in Jamaica. And uh, she talked about uh, the, it is in the background of the slave rebellion uh, in the 18th century, uh, Jamaica, I guess. And um, the novel talks about the darkness, the slavery, the colonization, and um, how women, you know, they become the perpetrators, spectators, and also the victims of violence. I think violence comes out as a very prominent uh, theme in the novel. Yes. And um, uh, what I gather, uh, uh, violence uh, um, in the novel has been shown as a result of power structures. It's not just uh, the men. If the men are in power, if they are violent, if, if the power is vested in the hands of the women, uh, women too get violent. So uh, uh, it's it's um, a very um, valid way of presenting how the you know the power structures and the um, when the power uh, is shifts from from one gender to another gender, um, violence also uh, takes place. So um, and the protagonist Lilith, a black female, um, she she is not uh, passive and submissive, and she also indulges in violence. And violence becomes a 
uh, means of uh, freedom and liberation for her. Yeah. Though I have not read the novel, but from your presentation, I could just make out uh, what this novel is all about. So um, uh, uh, I, I, do, I would just like to ask you on a personal note, do you think violence empowers, truly empowers a person? Basically, we know that the woman violence, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, we look out the 18, 19, those such centuries, the women have no potential right, right, uh, to show their kind of freedom. So uh, the violence are also bothered there in the mentioning in this uh, novel, the Lilith, the main characters were uh, employed a trope of saddest and brutal female mistress, right? So it's explore the meaning of. Uh, a violence and describe the atrocious act of uh, violence against uh, the black human. That's uh, it's uh, against uh, the uh, problem of violence that always against the part of human beings and uh, women all over. Okay, so you think uh, you, the, what you want to say is uh, violence is agonizing, um, not empowering eventually. Yeah. Uh, even in the later centuries, we know that uh, women are always affected by this of darkness, violence, right? They have no potential freedom to show their right in mm. front of societies or where they were women's fair of this. But we can develop through these situations. Okay. Uh, I think when when the things are out of hands and there is lawlessness, there is more of you know violence in the society. Um, um, I mean, controlling uh, controlling power, which kind of you know uh, takes away the the innate uh, the instinct of humans to uh, do violence. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know whether I, uh, it's it's relevant to the context of the novel. So I have not read it. So I will not go in depth about the whole thing of violence. But it is an interesting paper. I would love to read the novel after reading, after seeing your presentation. Uh, thank you, Ashwara S. Krishna. Uh, thank, you. We, uh, thank you so much. Now we have the fourth presenter. Um, I don't know whether he's here. Yeah. Uh, hello, Anup. Uh, this is Anup Kumar Das, and he is the Good assistant. Man. Hello. He's the assistant professor at the Department of English, Pandu College, Guwahati, Assam. The title of his presentation today is Questioning the Idea of Rape as Panacea in GM Kotzi's Disgrace. So over to you, Anup. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am, and other presenters uh, present here. Uh, the topic, as already ma'am has mentioned, the questioning the idea of rape as panacea in JM Kotzi's Disgrace. And I guess many of you have already read this novel, Disgrace, and which was published in 1999. And J.M. Koji won Booker Prize for this one. And J.M. Koji is the first novelist uh, who got Booker, first novelist uh, who got Booker Prize twice. Uh, uh, one Life and Times of Michael K. for this novel in 1983, 1983 and Disgrace in 1999. And he uh, won the um, Nobel Prize in uh, uh, 2003. His fiction overtly engages with the social and political history of apartheid and post-apartheid South Africa. As a South African uh, writer, Koji inhibits uh, a complex space uh, on the cusp of apartheid and post-apartheid experience. Koji's ethnic identity has always been questioned. He is a white South African writer who clearly distances himself from late colonial African identity with which this apartheid regime is associated. He is conscious of the slipperiness of his location as he feels no affinity with contemporary African identity in the apartheid year. But he admits that he can be branded Afrikaner on the basis of historical connection and as a way of identifying his guilt by association with the crimes committed by the whites in South Africa. South Africa is a racially charged society with a long and complicated history of subjugation of the black population. With the demise of apartheid era, sexual violence in South Africa is invariably seen between the black and white. The culture of sexual violence against women 
that prevailed under the apartheid period has become a hidden problem. The BBC survey in 2009 reveals that rape culture, quote unquote, uh, in South Africa under apartheid or post apartheid period has become normalized. In a study of sexual violence against women in post apartheid South Africa, Linian Arch observes, I quote, violence against women is still the most pervasive, yet least recognized. Every day, women are murdered, physically and sexually assaulted within their homes and communities. The social, cultural, and political structures and institutions in countries like South Africa continue to openly support gender inequality, despite political rhetoric to the country." Unquote. Numerous narratives related to rape circulate in South African public consciousness. The endemic of sexual violence against the white women is seen more as a racist than as sexist. In an article in the Washington Post, Charles Smith, a journalist who was raped by a black man, claimed that rape is endemic, quote unquote. Uh, in South African culture, rape is endemic. Rape is still an underreported crime, and it is believed that one only one in nine rape is reported to the police. Rejecting the endemic rape culture, President Thebo Becky denounces that rape narratives have been deployed for racist ends. Helen Muffet in her article, These women, they force us to rape them, rape as narrative of social control in post apartheid South Africa, states that, I quote, South Africa has a higher level of rape of women and children than anywhere else in the world, not at war or embroiled in civil conflict. At least one in three South African women can expect it can expect to be raped in her lifetime, unquote. Published in 1999, Disgrace undeniably sorry, draws an anxious, comfortless picture of post-apartheid South Africa. The novel is focalized through the inner monologue of David Lurie, twice divorced professor at a technical university. A brief fling with a much younger female student, Melanie, culminates into a bitter ending when David forces himself on her. Melanie files a complaint against David and eventually his refusal to apologize to the sexual harassment inquiry committee of the university cost him his job. But the major and second sexual violence occurs in the novel when the protagonist's daughter, Lucy, a white lady lesbian, is brutally attacked and gang raped by some black individu individuals in her isolated small holding. They rob the house physically assaulted David, and as a result of the rape, Lucy is impregnated. Lucy informs the police that the intruders stole a bunch of stuff, set David on fire, and shot the dogs, but she does not admit, uh, admit her rape to the police. David's sexual involvement with Melanie, as he confesses, was because he was, quote-unquote, in the grip of something beauty's rules. The poem drives straight as an arrow, unquote. He has an airy sense of instrumentality in his last for her. I quote, she does not own herself. Perhaps he does not own himself either, unquote. And it is, I quote, not rape, not quite that, um, but undesired nevertheless, undesired to the core, unquote. David Lurie perceives himself as a, I quote, servant of heroes. He strongly believes that it is his quote unquote rights of desire to have sexual affair with the student. And it occurred because of his un quote unquote ungovernable impulse. The two rape that take two rapes that take place in the novel reveal the power dynamics in each setting, the power of patriarchy and the power of the return of the repressed. Within this power hegemony, both Melanie and Lucy decide to be silent in the hope that their silence may speak speak volume of protest. Lucy's unwavering decision to be silent on the issue of being brutally raped apparently shows a sense of white guilt. She takes no legal action against her attackers as she terms the rape as quote unquote the price of staying on in New South Africa. Under Peter's guidance, Lucy has been placed through the act of rape. She has been rebuked, disgraced and quote unquote, put in her place. Thus, Lucy's charge would not be read or interpreted as a crime 
by men against a woman, but instead as a white woman accusing black men, an accusation that activates the black peril rape myth. In article Reading the Unspeakable, Rape in James Koji's Disgrace, Lucy Valerie Graham has extensively focused on the issue of sexual violence and talked, I quote, how rape may be read in its absence. Reading sexual violence requires listening not only to who speaks and in what circumstances, but who does not speak and why. David faces an implied parallel between his sexual coercion of Melanie and Lucy's sexual violation and felt humiliated by his inability to help his daughter. The rape of Lucy is brutal, racially charged and undeniable. The rape of Melanie is forced without physical violence. Her race is unclear. It is possible that not even Melanie conceptualizes the entire incident as rape. Being unbalanced, he was struggling to comprehend the assault on Lucy and referred her um, paradigmatically to a painting he saw as a child, the rape of the Sabayan woman. It can be seen in the mismatch between the cruel power dynamics of rape and its reality. The rape of the Sabayan woman is nevertheless a highly suggestive intertext, fearful of extinction, of their new settlement failing, the Romans seized upon the Sabine women because the Sabine fathers were prohibiting intermarriage. After their abduction, the Sabine women remained with their Roman husbands as loyal wives and peacemaker between the two sides. In the competition between Lucy's father and Pritas, who is related to one of the rapists, Lucy chooses Pritas as a husband to stay with him, to stay with him as an additional wife. She says, I quote, I must have peace around me. I am prepared to do anything, make any sacrifices for the sake of peace, I unquote. In an article reading the unspeakable rape in James Koji's disgrace, Lucy Graham states, I quote, disgrace seems to suggest that female bodies may not be fare better in new order, in post-apartheid, as after Lucy is raped, she becomes pregnant, gives up her land, retreats into the house, I unquote. The rape restricts Lucy and functions as silencer, a silence imposed by the rapist and sustained by inscrutable critters. Lucy attributes the sexual violence perpetrated on her as an inevitable payment of debt to the history of violence on the black community in the apartheid era, a sort of panacea to the accumulated wrong done by the community. The act of violence have reflected reflected South Africa's inverted power structures. A report at the police station on the rape of a white lady by some black people will hardly be considered or investigated in terms of gender. It will be inscribed or looked at in terms of race. Keeping it, keeping it in mind, perhaps Koji deliberately avoids delineating the graphical nature of the violence. Instead, he is very much conscious conscious of giving the physical description of the rapist. In an article, Rape and the Violence of Representation in J.M. Kochi, Karen Maru Dorsin argues that because of racial discourse in South Africa, the rape would not be read as a crime by man against women, instead a white woman accusing black men. It resonates Helen, Helen Moffitt's assertion that violence in South Africa is more considered in relation to race than gender. The rape in James Koji, in conclusion, the rape in James Koji's disgrace are represented in South Africa's inverted power structure and its traditional gender structure, the structure that silenced Melanie and Lucy. The novel suggests that the rape of Lucy signifies on a broad symbolic level that the black fellas is politically replacing the defunct white. Disgrace paints a dystopic picture of South Africa where sexual violence is ordinary and everyday history, so a quotidian reality. So the victim of Lucy, like the Sabine women, are in source of a sojourn peacemaking for which they are ready to accept rape as a sort of panacea. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Anup, for your uh, presentation on uh, questioning the idea of rape as panacea in J.M. Coetzee's uh, disgrace. You, uh, this, you talked about this novel 
disgrace and um, uh, how uh, David identifies um, his daughter's violation as rape and uh, at the same time um, unable to recognize his own act or his own act as, uh, um, as rape. And then it is absolutely because of his sexist and racist um, ideology that he um, inhabits and he cultures. And uh, I, I found it very interesting that how you talked about rape as being endemic in South Africa and um, how it goes unreported and um, um, the uh, how how you know um, I also found very interesting in your paper is how you talked about rape being more associated with the race rather than race gender. Rather than gender. Yes. Interesting angle that you brought in through your paper and how the black phallus replaces um, uh, the white one, uh, yes. uh, the inverted power structures. Uh, after post apartheid, I mean post apartheid South Africa, very That's interesting right. paper, and I congratulate you on that. And um, the, the the silence of Lucy for yes. um, you know being uh, silent as a kind of a guilt, which makes her you know yes. not speak about or report her incidents or uh, incident of rape. So a uh, very interesting paper, and a lot of uh, things you have brought in in your paper. Gender. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, would love to read the novel as well. I haven't read it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Anup, for your presentation. We're running out of time. Would love to discuss more on your paper, but we have another presenter. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, that was Anup with his presentation on Disgrace by J.M. Kodzi. Now we have our fifth and the last presenter, Deepti Makwan. I think she was here. Yes, I uh, can see Deepthi. Yes, uh, let me just briefly introduce you. Uh, Deepthi Makwan is a research scholar from the Department of Indian Languages and Literature, Sabarmati University, Ahmedabad. And uh, uh, along with her, uh, there's a paper co-written. And so along with her, there, there is Dr. Pratima Rai, Associate Professor, Department of uh, Indian Languages and Literature, Sabarmati University, Ahmedabad. The title of her presentation is Padmini's quest for identity and completion in Girish Karnad's Hevardana. So I uh, hand over the platform to you, Deepti. You can, um, you have just barely ten minutes to present. Okay. 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 Uh, good morning to all. Uh, today I will talk about uh, the topmost uh, play of uh, the remarkable writer Girish Karnad, <coughs> uh, and. Uh, that is Hey Vadina. Now, uh, yes, as ma'am has introduced my topic, uh, I would just uh, uh, talk about it as we don't have much time. Okay, so the title is Padmini's Quest for Identity and the Completion in Gripanath's uh, Hey Vadina. Yes. So now, if about Girish Karnad, uh, I talk, then uh, as we all know that uh, Karnad is the most imperative dramatist in Indian literature since independence. Uh, now, uh, for uh, <coughs> the paper, I have selected Hey Vadina, and from that, if hey, if we talk about Hey Vadina, almost all the characters are in search of uh, the completion. Uh, okay, uh, they are in the desire of. Uh, uh, they are in the quest of fulfillment, but uh, here, as uh, the topic is about uh, female, especially, I have selected the character of Padmini. Now, uh, yes, the plot of Hevdina was uh, adapted uh, first of all, yes, from uh, Thomas Mann's novel Transported Heads. And uh, in this drama, Karnad attempts to reveal humanity uh, and human identity in the world of. Uh, <clears throat> And tangent relationships. The main plot begins with uh, the straightforward love triangle, and that is of Padmini, Kapila, and Devdutta. Uh, now, Padmini has a multifaceted nature uh, in uh, the play. Uh, her first meeting only with uh, Kapila proves her uh, as a remarkable uh, and bold and uh, beautiful uh, woman. Uh, 
when uh, kapila goes to padmini for the first time uh, with the proposal uh, of uh, his friend devdatta padmini uh, says uh, that yes uh, uh, i would uh, like to read the dialogue uh, you knock didn't you then kapila says yes padmini then why are you gazing at me what do you want i just wanted to know whose house this was padmini whose house do you want kapila this one padmini i see then who do you want here kapila says the master padmini do you know his name kapila then says no padmini <coughs> have you met him kapila no okay so in this dialogue we can see that uh, she is not at all a meek and uh, timid type of a person who is uh, getting silent uh, at the very first meeting of such a man kapila okay now yes the above conversation between kapila and padmini highlights her sharpness logical and questioning and her degree of confidence and she is conversing with kapila for the first time even okay she talks to him confidently and smartly now after marriage of padmini and devdatta there are some circumstances in which the viewers unquestionably despise her yet there are other some circumstances in which they feel compassion also for her so that much power is there with padmini now after marriage when they are going for uh the ujjain fair at the time kapila was driving the cart at the time she says without any hesitation and with the surprise that yes how beautifully you drive the cart kapila your hands don't even move but the auction seems to know exactly which way you want them to uh, go okay so here also she doesn't care about her husband she is just praising the another man without any hesitation then after yes when she declares her desire for kapila's <coughs> figure the viewer find her repulsive as she says how he climbs like an app okay so here also we can notice her willingness to get the body of kapila then in the next scene when they go to the temple of kali uh, at that time also in front of the goddess even she says that that at least one of them was alive i could have passed my life with them okay so here also we can say that she expresses her desire to have kapila as her husband the explosive free float violation consciousness of padmini yearns for the ideal guy hayavadna however allows us to feel padmini spirited and embodied intellect highlighting the ideals of female subjectivity as they are manifest in her the owner of transgressive erotic agency padmini is a woman who aspires to create a space without being constrained by a, a pre detective identity in act 2 if we talk about uh hey vidana than the person of to whom padmini belongs might have had an answer the entrance of padmini makes man aware of the pain that love may cause as a legally wed wife padmini is required to go to devdatta since the paternity of her child is determined by the spouse she selected the loving and contented times i had with kapila had to end in order to have an undifferentiated united body and mind padmini aspires to accomplish the union when padmini sends devdatta to a fair and then to the bush to see kapila her second round of searching gets started here also we can see her search for completion as now devdatta's body has been transformed totally okay that is why yes kapila is not interested in showing up first 
there are a lot of why questions in a series according to karnad people are content with their questions and are concerned with getting their questions answered in every dialogue padmini emerges as a modern woman of self trait and boldness she does not have fear to fear of adverse condition of her health she acts according to her own free thinking the character of padmini has merits of feminism it reveals a woman's love for liberty and self confidence she does not need a special treatment or conduct like a doll full of delicacy so in the conclusion i would like to say that however in the play havadana karnad explores the identity problem and incompleteness that every person in the current world is going through in her play uh in the play padmini embodies modern society as someone who is looking for the true self and a sense of fulfillment here we see the moral and psychological facts of identity crisis issues therefore practically even internal crisis that arises in being is resolved before returning and because there is always a need for identity and completion this eternal search for that never stops the play's introduction and conclusion are beautifully done by karnad who starts it with an <coughs> appeal of lord ganesha who represents imperfection through the narrator bhagavata and ends with the prayer i quote here grant us o lord good rain good crop prosperity in poetry since sorry science industry and other affairs give the rulers of our country success in all and yours and along with it a little bit of sense i unquote here yes uh, i would like to explain that uh, why i have uh, hurried because i know the timing is about uh, <clears throat> 10 to 11 so now uh, that is why i have done it so hurriedly uh padmini if i talk about means uh, face to face i would like to explain padmini if we talk about is always in the search of uh completeness fulfillment and that is why though she has married to devdatta she is in uh, acute desire of kapila who is who is having the strong body and that is why uh though her husband uh, has a brilliant mind uh, but a stout body she is not satisfied with such a type of body and uh, yes she desires both the strong mind as well as the strong body and that is why uh, at the end when uh, devdatta's body has been transformed totally she goes in search of kapila in the forest with her child there thank you ma'am okay thank you deepthi uh, for your presentation uh, you talked about uh, hey vardana Uh, hey vadana by uh, girish karna the quest for identity and completion and um, the character of padmini who emerges as uh, you know aspiring for um, perfection she is an incarnation incarnation for uh, you know the quest for perfection and um, uh, as you talked about she is torn apart between uh, you know choosing the body or the mind and she wants both uh, that is uh, th- that is the human uh, you know dilemma all the time you want perfection in everything and uh, when it deludes you it it, it, it you you feel uh, disheartened and frustrated and that can be seen in the character of padmini as you brought out through your paper and um, uh, i liked uh, what i liked about your paper was uh, how you began your paper by uh, symbolically uh, beginning it that each uh, character in the um, uh, in the drama the play written by karnad is imperfect and striving for perfection in some way or the other and of course since it's a um, it's a seminar on uh, women in literature your focus was obviously on padmini and uh, her subjectivity uh through um, um you know her female subjectivity that you have focused on um, and her you focused on the character of her being fearless and she acts according to what she thinks she wants that is kind of giving her agency and power yes 
uh, I appreciate that. And um, she acts according to her free will. But uh, eventually, the you know, the, the play has a tragic ending, I believe. Um, it has a tragic ending, though Kanan has tried to bring it to some kind of a hopeful ending at the end by bringing the child of Padmini towards the end of the play. And also by bringing in Ganesha, the, you know, the epitome of, um, you know, imp imperfect body for that matter you know having an elephant head on a human body so uh, that's that's the beauty yeah. of Kannad's play and um, um, lovely paper by uh, Deepti um, thank you um, mostly papers were on um, uh, novels yours was on uh, a play that was um, uh, something different we have had in the session so it was a wonderful session I thank all the presenters and i congratulate each one of you for bringing in your research gains and your knowledge um, uh, knowledge uh, i think my voice is going to somebody okay so um, uh, i thank all of you for your presentations each one of you uh, were wonderful at your presentations and i'm um, glad